My yeah. name is Reza Jalali and uh, we're sitting in Falmouth, Maine. And I came to Maine 24, 25 years ago as a refugee. Prior to coming to Maine, I was in India studying and being in self-exile. I'm a Kurd from Iran. I was born in Kurdistan, Iran. And as a member of a Kurdish uh, group, a minority group in Iran, we were persecuted and that continues to this day. And I felt like a second class citizen. And at one point during my high school years, my parents felt concerned about my physical safety. The secret police of the then Shah of Iran's government was persecuting, arresting and killing Kurdish young men and women. I left Iran, went to India to continue my studies. And while I was in India, there was a change in government in Iran. The fundamentalists came to power and they have not been that kind to Kurds neither. And as a result, I became a stateless person when I was very young. And I had no country to go back to. Meanwhile, the Iran-Iraq war start, started. And uh, so I came to the United States as a refugee. You got to remember that when I came here in mid 80s, the, the Americans were still recovering from the hostage crisis. So as an Iranian, it was not fun to be around people who felt that every Iranian was guilty by, by, uh, because of association. Add to that the fact that, that I'm a Muslim and a Middle Eastern man, and, and all that didn't help. And my name, of course. As a, people would look at me, stare at me, and a few times that was articulated, that why don't you go back to your camels? And, uh, and mind you, I'd never seen a camel in Iran, in Kurdistan, or anywhere. I go to places, I go to shop, I go to offices, and people without giving me a chance to express myself, to say anything. They would say, do you need an interpreter? I know, or not, not realizing that I've done postgraduate work here, that I teach at a public university, that I've written books in English, that, that, that I didn't come yesterday. I wanted to put a human face on these communities that we call refugees and immigrants in Maine. Maine is the whitest state in the country. This is really hard for many to believe that in the whitest state in, in the country we have thousands, tens of thousands of refugees and immigrants. But also I wanted to dispel myths, common myths about refugees and immigrants. We all are tired of hearing the common myth that refugees and immigrants come here for welfare. They come here to steal jobs, uh, to, tell, to have them tell their own stories. What made them leave their homelands, what happened in transition, the adjustments they had to make in order to fit in in Maine. And each and every one of us as a refugee or immigrant had to drop some of our uh, cultural practices. We had to shed some of our uh, cultural trappings and, and work hard to fit in. So you see a distinction here to be made between immigrants who come to this country willingly and refugees who, who come here in search of safeties. One way to define these two is that, that refugees are pushed out of their homelands where immigrants are pulled by the host country. Another way to define this is that refugees come here in their bodies, the minds are still back at home, and immigrants come with their heads and bodies. They plan this trip. One of the things that refugees and immigrants need is to have to find that sense of community, to again become somebody, to gain that sense of community, to gain back some of that human dignity which was lost in the process. 
in Maine, we're fond of saying that we are a very tolerant place. And, and I have started to have a problem with that because to me, tolerant is, you, you, toler, you tolerate this really nasty old relative who shows up every Thanksgiving and we tolerate him and her and his or her bad jokes and then we say we're done for another year. So I, I, don't, I want this state, this place, this community to move forward, to go to a different stage and that's acceptance. I'm, I'm still waiting for that to happen. As community activists, our work with the community doesn't end exactly at five o'clock. The real work starts. Um, I work for the university system. Prior to that, I worked for the state. I worked as a social worker for the city of Portland. And I used to joke with my boss that you all go home after five o'clock. My real work with the community starts at five. Because the phone rings, there's a single mom who is without oil in the middle of winter and she doesn't know English and she doesn't know where to go. She doesn't know how to get in touch with the landlord or someone is in trouble with the law or someone is being evicted or sometimes uh, a person wants to get into university and the evening time is the only time they could have a conversation with me. They walk during the day, they cannot take time off. So as a community activist, a grassroots community activist, you really don't have, it's 24-7, it's, it's on all the time. Maine is home to some large tribes of Native Americans, and these are uh, sons and daughters of, of this land. So most of them are first time, uh, first generation when it comes to higher education. No one else in the families has attended school. And so we work with them and, and again, creating bridges between Native American students and those who have come after them. So we bring all these students, Africans, Asians, Americans, former enemies, people who frankly have been brainwashed about each other. I have Muslim students who arrive at our doorsteps uh, hating, I mean, I know this is a strong term, but hating Jews because, again, they come from lands, not all of them, in a few cases. They come from countries where all their lives they've been brainwashed about Israel and about this and that. Serbs and Bosnians, I think, is another great example. Pakistanis and Indians. And, and they come to us, and once we create this, this sense of safety for them so they can talk about what is bothering them, all that dark information out there that we cannot, we should never ignore this. Because if you've seen a family member being killed by, by group or groups that now you have a student from that group represented in the campus, I mean, you're coming face to face with your former enemy. But the power of forgiveness and the understanding that, that that the cycle of violence has to end somewhere. I do find myself defending uh, Islam, this peaceful religion, in front of uh, different audiences and again helping them to make the distinction between the actions of a few zealous extremists, if you will, and fundamentalists and every religion we understand has its share of these crazy people and the vast majority, the faceless vast majority of, of peaceful Muslims. A Muslim's worldview in Turkey is different than the worldview of a Muslim in Indonesia and these two would be different, I promise you, than, than one in Saudi Arabia. And somehow we find it convenient to really lump them all together and say Muslims are violent or they're all terrorists and there's danger in making that a statement. So I find myself defending at the same time creating this, this new awareness